We've talked in depth about the development and presentation of The Last Remnant. Now it's time to dive into the story. Normally, when I talk about an RPG, this is one of the larger sections. Sadly for The Last Remnant, this part of the equation falls tragically flat. It's still going to be a long video because I'm going to give you a summary of the entire story. Let's dive in. When it comes to RPGs or any fantasy story really, the lore is an integral part of world building. In order to understand the world in which the story takes place, we need some background. In the case of The Last Remnant, the story takes place in a world dominated by remnants, powerful objects which hold mysterious powers. Their origin is unknown, but they've been used as tools by mankind for as long as history can remember. The remnants are largely beneficial to those cities built around them, and the individuals who have bound the remnants, that is, created an exclusive bond with that remnant during its time of luminescence. Once a person has bound a remnant, it cannot be bound to anyone else. Because of this, individuals bound to powerful remnants have incredible power. Some may ask, if some remnants grant extreme power, why allow them to be bound at all? Well, as it turns out, all remnants must be bound. A remnant that lies unbound for too long will cause a collapse, a catastrophe that once leveled an entire city. Collapses also cause monsters to appear. This is a great little piece of world building that explains why the game world is populated by monsters. So in summary, once a remnant goes luminescent, it must be bound or a collapse will occur. Long ago, there was a family called the Marshals who had mysterious powers. They could use magic, among other things. According to legend, Marion Marshall was the first to bind herself to a remnant. The Marshals are only mentioned in side quests and NPC dialogue, even though they're actually really important to the story. The Last Remnant does a poor job of explaining its lore to the player. Bits are given out during the main story, but a tremendous amount of lore is relegated to optional side content. This can be really frustrating because there's so much optional content that it's extremely difficult to keep track of the information as it trickles in. You can get deeper bits of lore by talking to the NPCs in various towns, who will give the player details about each remnant or tell you other stories about remnants, but unless you're taking notes, you're probably going to miss a lot of it. Spoilers are incoming, so if you don't want the story ruined, I recommend you bookmark this video for later. The Last Remnant takes place in an unnamed game world ruled by an all-powerful god emperor. As you progress throughout the game, you'll visit various cities and wild locations. This world that is populated by powerful remnants sits on top of a cave system called Siebenber, which leads to the Secret Lands. It's absolutely based on the common high fantasy swords and sorcery type template. There are magical forests and creatures, towering castles, all should be very familiar to any fan of high fantasy and role playing games. The story begins in the woods close to the Yamarn Plain, which borders the city of Athlum. That's really where the tale begins in earnest. The protagonist of our story is a young Rush Sykes, whose parents are researchers working at the Academy, the world's largest research organization. He lives with his younger sister, Irina. Rush comes off as carefree, sometimes to a fault. His friendly nature and unyielding honesty inspire trust and confidence in the characters he meets on his journey. He is fiercely protective of Irina. Irina is a cheerful young girl who has a unique ability that makes her very valuable to the villains of our story, and we'll get more into that a bit later. Some other major characters we'll encounter are David Nassau, Marquis of Athlum, who offers to help Rush in his quest. While David initially helps Rush because he thinks the protagonist may be useful, they become close friends over the course of the story. Nassau's opulent clothing and exotic appearance belie a deeply burdened leader who is plagued by self-doubt as he tries to protect his people from war and pursue independence from the larger and more powerful city of Salapole. David is bound to the powerful remnant Gaybolg and commands a group of generals that will become the core members of your party. The first villain you'll encounter is Wagram, a mysterious wizard who has lived for over 1,000 years. He was once married to Marion Marshall. It is believed that Wagram can use the lost art of magic. He seems to be connected to Duke Ermion, the leader of the Academy, who seems to be manipulating the other leaders into the war. Ermion is the Duke of Nagapur and the most powerful political leader in the world. The game's main antagonist, however, is the Conqueror, a powerful and mysterious being. Little is known about him when the player first encounters him, but his goals and motivations are made known as the story progresses. 
From here, I'll be breaking down the story, so heavy spoilers are incoming. I'll try and keep it somewhat brief as to avoid making the video too long. While the story is one of the weakest points of The Last Remnant, one of the reasons for that is that the pacing is really bad, so the side content is disruptive to the overarching narrative. But I think a plot summary will help you enjoy the story a lot more. The story begins when Irina Sykes is kidnapped. Rush is protected from the monsters by his amulet. Seeking to protect his sister, Rush pursues and winds up on a battlefield where the Marquis of Athlum, David Nassau, uses his remnant, Gybolg. This causes the Earth to swallow up Rush and one of Nassau's generals. Rush then meets Nassau, who offers to help him find Arena, noting the incredible power of Rush's amulet and how it may be of use to him. Back in Athlum, Rush is asked to help the generals with a few tasks. And finally, they track Arena and her kidnappers to Dilmore, where a wild remnant has been spotted. This is where we first see Wagram, who escapes pursuit by summoning a flying monster and seems to be in a big hurry to bring Irina to the next remnant. The story continues in this fashion for a while, with Wagram bringing Irina to additional remnants with Rush in hot pursuit. Wagram tries to get Irina to bind these remnants, but has to make a hasty escape. Wagram threatens David with consequences from the Academy if he doesn't let this go, claiming that Irina is very special. David is unwilling to give up on saving Irina, but knows he cannot trust the other lords because they may be connected to Wagram. The Marquis of Athlum has gone rogue. David uses the annual Congress of Lords and Elysian as an opportunity to investigate Hermione, and the Conqueror appears for the first time. Rush's pendant reacts to the Conqueror and causes him to have some visions before snapping back to reality and seeing that the Conqueror has bound Illusion's remnant. This shouldn't be possible. The remnant was already bound to Hermione. The Conqueror demands his own lordship and a remnant, only releasing Elysian when Hermione agrees. This understandably terrifies everyone concerned. The Conqueror has displayed that he can pretty much do whatever he wants. David says he cannot oppose the Academy to go after Arena, but instead suggests finding Rush's parents in the Temple of Illusion. Here, John Sykes tells Rush that Walgram is after a tablet that is in John's possession and that Marina has left a decoy, but Rockram appears nevertheless and takes the tablet. These parts get a little confusing. I may have some details mixed up. Uh, as a side note, by the way, the city, uh, it's spelled like Elysian, but in the game they pronounce it as Illusion, so I'm going to pronounce it that way going forward. Davij General Emma tells Rush that she might know where Marina, his mother, is, and asks to go alone with Rush to find her. It's strongly hinted at that Emma and Marina are very well acquainted. We learn that Marina is actually a descendant of Marion Marshall and the God Emperor, and that as such, she has Marion's blessing, the ability to bind remnants at will whether they're luminous or not, and even if someone else has already bound them. The Conqueror begins his march, with some dukes supporting the Conqueror for fear of the God Emperor, who the Conqueror claims is on his side. Others rally behind Duke Hermione. Marquis Nassau joins Hermione's side, hoping this will help him earn independence for Athlum. The group heads to Nagapur to meet with Hermione, but receives a report that the Conqueror's troops are on the way to sell a palais. David gives Rush a flower from Marina, indicating that she's with Hermione and she's safe, at least for now. Rush has no choice but to trust Hermione and go back to Athlum to prepare for the defense of Celepole. Emma stays behind to protect Athlum while the rest of the group meets the Conqueror's troops at the Nest of Eagles. The Conqueror's forces win the battle and the Conqueror attacks Athlum alone, killing Emma in single combat. After David talks about how Emma basically raised him, her daughter Emmy shows up and immediately takes her place, completely annihilating any emotional impact this scene may have had. <laughs> I guess the friendship between Emmy and Marina makes David and Rush like cousins, kind of? I think that was the main takeaway from this particular sequence of events. And they did the old swap a -roo here, obviously because you put a lot of time and effort into building Emmy and you don't want to lose all that time and effort, especially if she's a core member of your team, so you get a replacement that looks exactly like her and gets all of her abilities. Anyway, Marina smartens everyone up that Ermion is actually plotting to make himself God Emperor by manipulating the Conqueror and Wagram, which is neither a good plan nor a plan that Marina would reasonably be privy to, but let's go ahead and move on. All right, now that we know Ermion has been a bad guy all along, it's time to go save Arena before he uses Marion's blessing to seize all the remnants. The party heads through the aqueducts and into Worm's Keep, where Wagram summons the infamous Gates of Hell boss, who is basically a power check at this point. Rush spontaneously and without explanation gains the ability to summon Cyclops during this battle. 
David confronts Armayan, who hides behind Arena, only to be erupted by Wagram, who inexplicably teleports our heroes away to safety as the Conqueror arrives in Nagapur. Wagram reveals that he was only pretending to be on Armayan's side, and he was actually with the Conqueror all along. Big double cross. The heroes encounter the Conqueror on their way out of Worm's Keep, and the ensuing battle results in a bomb destroying most of Nagapur. I gave you the uh, abridged version of those events. Six months go by, with Ermion presumed dead and the entire kingdom at war. The Duke of Gore has taken over as chairman of Congress and plans to find new remnants in hopes that giving people those new remnants will result in peace. This is the halfway point in the story, and on the Xbox 360 version, the end of Disc 1. At this point, the Duke of Gore asks the gang to head to Fornstrand to investigate an unbound remnant there. Remember the tablet that Walgrim stole before? His henchmen are here with it, and they use it to bind the remnant. As it turns out, the tablet allows the one holding it to bind to any remnant. Back in Athlum, the Conqueror appears to Arena to tell her not to forget about her power. The gang's new mission is to protect the existing remnants so that the Conqueror cannot bind them all. To accomplish this, the Sykes create a remnant locator device. What's weird here is that you can get your own tablet of Marshall that allows Rush and anyone else in the group to bind to various remnants around the world, but it's relegated to a side quest, and those remnants aren't really all that powerful. They're usually special weapons. Uh, it's weird that it, this is buried in a side quest. It seems really important to the plot, but the only remnants that you can even bind are like secondary and tertiary remnants, so I guess it's not that important after all. Then there's the question of like, why do you need the tablet if you have Urena? There's a lot of contradictions here. The gang is summoned to a conference with the Duke of Gore in Illusion, and Rush finally stops being so protective and suggests that Arena attends the conference. At the conference, Arena makes a very important observation, that a remnant could be hiding in plain sight, disguised as a Mitra, remember a human. This is going to be very important later on. If you're confused about a Mitra being a human, go back to my design video and I discuss the four races that uh, exist in the world. Uh, in short, they're the Mitra, which are human, and then there's the four-armed cat people guys, there are the gigantic fish men, and then there are the little frog rabbit dudes, uh, the four different races that, that make up this world. Uh, but I already covered that in detail in the design video, so let's move on. No other lords show up, so of course the gang is ordered to investigate. They find that the other dukes are very ill, and Duke of Gore suspects foul play. Luckily, Hermione just happens to appear to explain everything! How convenient! The old villain comes to tell the good guy his plan trope. Hermione has been powered up by the remnants, and he tried to share his power with the other lords, but they couldn't handle it. Yeah, right, sure buddy. Hermione tries to recruit the Duke of Gore to the bad guy team, but Duke isn't having it, so he prepares for war. It's all out war now, there ain't no stopping it. The gang uses the Remnant GPS to find that there are six remnants all around a place called Kenningsdorf. Irina identifies that their sinister energy is the same power that was emanating from Ermion. The six dots are bases, each of which is controlled by one of Ermion's generals. For the next piece of the game, you must defeat each of these generals, affectionately referred to as the Seven. When the gang reaches Ermion, he merges with a remnant. After the heroes defeat Ermion, the Conqueror shows up and attacks him. Another double cross. Then he tells Rush he's of no use if he hasn't woken up yet. Well, there's some foreshadowing for you. Irina uses her exceptional powers to protect Rush from the Conqueror, and they all go back to Athlum. Back in Athlum, they find that another remnant has been found in Darkened Forest, and Irina has gone after it alone. So obviously, Rush and his best bro Dave go after her. They rescue Irina, but the remnant remains unbound. Back in Athlum, Duke Cubine appears to tell David that Athlum has gained its independence, and he is now the acting chairman of the Congress, until the Duke of Gore recovers from his wounds, and that his next assignment is to go and meet with the God Emperor in Underwald, and find out what his intentions were with blessing the Conqueror. This is where we reach the climax of the story right before the conclusion. As it turns out, the God Emperor teleports the gang to the Sacred Lands, Wagram appears and makes a huge reveal. He and his ilk worship remnants as gods, and the Conqueror himself is a remnant. A sentient remnant, the only one of his kind. The God Emperor reveals that he himself is on Team Bad Guy, and tells the gang that anyone who interferes with the Conqueror will be treated as a traitor. The Conqueror marches toward Illusion, looking to bind the Ark, Illusion's remnant. 
Finding this remnant would grant him absolute power. Navi decides to defy the God Emperor and stop the Conqueror. This leads to a battle on the Holy Plains, a trip through Siebenbur, and finally, the Sacred Lands where the gang encounters the Conqueror for the last time. He finally reveals his plan to release the Remnants. Being a Remnant himself, the Conqueror is Warden of the Remnants, and he believes humanity has been misusing them, and that it is his responsibility to take them away. He also reveals that Armayan was an experiment, a way to see what would happen if the Remnants were set free. Then the story throws us a little bit of a curveball. The titular last Remnant? It's Rush, and he was supposed to be the one to release the Remnants, but he never woke up. After the final battle, in the last twist of the game, the Conqueror tries to use his dying breath to release the Remnants, but Rush, knowing this means mankind is doomed, uses the Ark to destroy every single Remnant. Ultimately, he fulfills his destiny, leading humanity to learn to survive without the Remnants. And of course, Rush being a Remnant himself is gone forever. Normally, watching a protagonist die in a game's finale would be devastating, but because of the awkward pacing of the game, it's really awkward and it's hard to feel a connection to Rush or any of the game's cast, really. It's a shame because taken as a single continuous narrative, the story isn't bad, it's actually pretty good. It's a cautionary tale of mankind becoming too dependent on an external source. The Remnants could be an allegory for religion or technology, natural resources, a number of other things, right? The Conqueror is the looming threat of losing those things we rely on and having them turned against us. Irina could represent our attempts to control them, and Rush, of course, is the ultimate resolution of destroying that dependency entirely, an action whose consequences are dire, but certainly better than the alternative. Armayan shows us how power can cause corruption, and of course, we have the real hero of the story in David. The Sam to Rush is Frodo, who makes all this possible by lending Rush the power of his generals even in the face of powerful opposition. Although Rush is not related to Irina by blood, he is fiercely protective of her, because of experiences they shared together, and also to atone for his own mistakes. Rush's bromance with David goes over the course of the story, and it transcends the social class, these relationships demonstrate the power of mutual respect and loyalty in the face of adversity. That is the story of The Last Remnant in a nutshell. I hope this helps answer any questions you may have and demystifies the question of what exactly is going on here that many of us have had during this adventure. Normally I have a lot more to say when it comes to JRPG stories in terms of analysis of themes, uh, but there's really just not that much meat on the bone here. We have the very obvious theme of Depending on this thing is ultimately bad, and it's better to destroy it than have it turned against us. That's been done a million times, and then we've got some of the friendships that occur in the game and the relationships, but there's really not much more than that. There are all these characters in the game that are really there as window dressing. They're there for the gameplay part of it. They're not there for the story. So even though you have up to 40 recruitable characters, uh, not including soldiers, only like five of them are really important to the story. So it is what it is. Anyway, my next video is going to be a real doozy. I'm going to break down the gameplay of The Last Remnant. And this game is deep. It's got a lot of moving pieces. So I really hope that it'll help both veteran players and newcomers to understand the game better. And I think it'll serve as a good introduction to The Last Remnant for anyone who hasn't played. So be sure to enable the notifications so you don't miss out on that. And until next time, game on.